I just returned from about a three to six week, depending on how you count the start and the stop of my trip, from Europe, where I was spending um, really quite a lot of time working in the Balkans, Macedonia, Kosovo, and Bosnia. I returned a couple of weeks ago and got my second book published, which is called uh, Freedom from Fear, which is a way to move forward from what I consider to be this endemic and entrenched mass delusional psychosis that I wrote about in my first book back in November of last year called United States of Fear. And I've thought a lot about where we are in the U.S. and where Europe is, especially Southern and Eastern Europe in the last couple of months. And I've come to some new conclusions that don't contradict what I was saying two years ago, but they certainly expand on it, and I'd like to share that with you today. Back in May of 2020, I was first asked to speak publicly. I was not writing, I was not speaking, I was simply working as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, which is my occupation, up in West Los Angeles. And the reason why I was asked, and I was asked by Mary Barkey and Jeff Barkey, who you're probably familiar with, Jeff Barkey is my co-podcast host, a family physician down in Orange County, here in Orange County, who has been working with me for a couple of years, speaking primarily to churches up and down the coast, and also shares Informed Dissent, which is our podcast together, where we broadcast about once every week. He came and spoke here as well about a year or two years ago. And they invited me, the Barkeys, since his wife works in the school system as a representative for the board, to talk about the problem with the schools. What's going on? Why are the schools closed? Why are we not allowing our children to go back to school? And more importantly, when are we going to reopen the schools? And this was such a, looking back on it, a funny question. Because the schools were closed right before the end of the school year. This was May. So school was going to be over in about a month or so. And all the parents were at the meeting asking, when are we going to get them back over again? With schools ending soon, we've got to get them open again. I mean, they had no idea no idea that not only would the schools not reopen before summer, they wouldn't reopen before the next school year or the next school year. Of course, all of that was an unknown at this time. So I was asked to go to speak at this meeting and I listened to about 100, 150 reasonable, rational, concerned parents who were physically there in front of me like you are today and read comments from probably two or 300 completely insane parents who were zooming in and just posting stuff one after another, just this row of posts just cycling through the screen. And I was sitting there watching it as I listened to other speakers and the board give their two cents about the schools and when to reopen them. And I realized, my goodness, there's a real divide here. There's a divide between people who are still living their lives in person as we are now, talking, touching, smelling, eating, drinking, living the life of what we are meant as human beings to be, which are social creatures in a social life. And this other group, which was growing rapidly, which are people who were locked into a fear mindset, scared to death, unable to take risks, compliant and obedient, but not to a higher power like God, but a higher power like government. That was the first inkling I had at that meeting outside of what I was reading in the news, but firsthand, me at a public forum, that something had gone terribly wrong. And so I sat there and listened, and I'm just reflecting hour after hour, it went from five to six to seven to eight to nine, finally I think 10.30 p.m. I got up to speak, five minutes, brief summary, on what I was thinking about and where I was hoping things would be going. And I remember standing up to the podium and just looking around, looking at the crowd. I didn't have any notes. I, I hadn't written any points or questions down. And I just looked around at the crowd and I said, you know, the real question today is not when do we reopen the schools? The real question is why are we here? Have we asked that question, why are we here? <laughs> and I, I answered that question for them. And I said, the reason why we're here is because we, the adults, are afraid. And not only that, but the consequences of our fear of we the adults being afraid 
is that we have chosen to abdicate our parental responsibilities and let our children down. Because we allow the schools to close. They never closed the schools in Sweden. Up to age 16, they were open the entire time. How many children in Sweden died of the Chinese Wuhan virus? <coughs> Zero. Zero. But we closed them down. We, the adults, closed them down. And I said, this is a problem. Because if we, the adults, are shutting down the schools to so-called protect children, but what we're really doing is acting out our own neuroses, our own anxiety, we're sacrificing our children on the altar of protecting the old. Now we've inverted the social structure. Now we've actually committed what I consider to be an evil. We have never before in our country sacrificed the young to save the old. Now we didn't do it, we didn't succeed anyway, but that was the goal, that was the purpose. The purpose itself was wrong as well as, of course, the implementation and everything that followed. But the idea was wrong. The theory was wrong. The psychology behind it was wrong. It was sick. And I pointed that out. And little did I know, my quote, what I had just said, would show up in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks later under the notables and quotables section. And that's how I began my speaking tour and being invited to different local events and eventually state events and Washington, D.C. with Dr. Simone Gold who's now in federal prison. She's a political prisoner in the state of Florida, along with 600 Americans who are political prisoners in a basement in Washington, D.C. I mean, I never thought I would say this ever, that we actually have political prisoners in this country now. That This is like the Soviet Union. It's not an embellishment or an exaggeration. We are living a Soviet world right now in a lot of ways in this country, which is terrifying. And I began to speak with other doctors, many doctors whom you know, Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Robert Malone, Dr. Pierre Corey, Dr. Brian Tyson, and we traveled and we gave our two cents. I spoke from the psychiatric, psychological point of view, they spoke from the research point of view, infection point of view, um, what to do on a local level with helping people get better, protect them from illness. We did this for two years. And I came to reach a point about the middle of last year where I started to, to recognize that it didn't really matter. What didn't matter was the information and the education. Because what happened very early on, just like in that meeting in May that I described at the school board meeting, people had bifurcated into two groups. Those who were no longer interested, willing, or able to think, and to act logically and to use common sense, and those who were. Now, there were some people who were a bit ambivalent, hesitant, concerned, but they were curious. So they sought out information. They wanted to find out what was real. Their quest for truth was what drove them. All of those people are in one camp. The other people, they weren't curious. They weren't looking for truth. They were reacting emotionally. They were scared. And by and large, those people are still living that way today. There has been very little movement after the first two months. Very little movement. And that group now has become an entrenched component of our society. And they are, by and large, redefining our social norms. All of our social norms have been redefined, not by the most courageous among us, but by the most fearful. This does not bode well for our society. The United States was not founded upon risk management. It was not founded upon keeping ourselves safe. The mortality rate was 20 or 30 percent, sometimes up to 50 percent, among those Americans who crossed from the east to the west during the early years in the founding of our country. And they accepted this. They accepted this not just as a risk, but as a known. They would lose one or two of their children. It was a known, and they did it anyway, because they knew that the reason for doing it was better, was greater, than staying where they were and playing it safe. We are not meant to live safe lives. We are meant to live full lives, and full lives involve risk. It involves courage, and the, the definition of courage is to put yourself at risk for something that's important to you, even if you're scared, perhaps because you're scared, and to act in spite of your fear and to take that risk anyway. We've turned our backs on that in the last two years as Americans, largely. It is no longer considered a virtue to be courageous and to take risks. It is considered a virtue to be safe, 
to worship at the altar of safety. This is a perversion or a twisting of the good. After I published my book in November of last year, outlining the antecedents of how we got culturally to where we were, how we got psychologically to where we were, how we got politically to where we were, and I pointed to a lot of areas. This was not something that just showed up in March of 2020. We had been massaged and primed into this kind of mass delusional psychosis based upon fear for a very long time. It, you could go back to perhaps post-war era, the duck and cover drills. You get under this desk and suddenly you're safe from a nuclear attack. <laughs> well, jump forward 75 years, you get under this desk and you're safe from a virus. But if you stand up, it's going to get you. That's equally insane. But it's equally driven by fear. And the reason for instilling fear in people is always the same. It's control, compliance, and power. Because a fearful people are more easily controlled. You move forward 10, 20 years, and you start to see these movements picking up that are not purely Soviet American fear propaganda. Not that the Soviet Union wasn't a danger, but this idea that we can protect ourselves from this danger by going under a desk is absurd. But these more social movements that started in the 70s and the 80s and just continued. I mean, they're ramping up today. They're going on an exponential increase in speed. Started with areas like the feminist movement. We need to be afraid of men because men are dangerous. Men are toxic. Men are patriarchal. Men are misogynistic. White people are all dangerous. They're all racist. The world around us, the, the living environment, is, is going to collapse in seven years. That was, what, 35 years ago? <laughs> Donald Trump is dangerous. Donald Trump is still the reason why your pet is ill. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now, now we're being told that if you have a child who's two or three or four or five or ten years old who comes to you and says, Mommy, I really enjoy wearing your high-heeled shoes. Does that make me a girl? And you don't say to your son, absolutely, whatever you wish. In fact, if you want to change your name, that's great. I'll, I'll join you on your gender journey. And, and as you get older, I'll teach you how to tuck your penis between your legs and make it look like a vagina and put tape over it. Because that's what they're doing at the Yale Gender Studies Clinical Teaching Program and Boston Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital. And then if you're a girl, we'll absolutely get those breasts off by the age of 12 because they're really becoming an encumbrance for you. You gotta stop taping them up like you have them. We just gotta get rid of them. And then we'll do vaginoplasty. If you don't say that to your child now, the doctor, the nurse, the therapist, at the hospital, at these programs, will tell you the parent, well, your child is gonna kill himself. Your child's gonna kill herself if you don't affirm that gender journey. That is the official therapeutic stance of the psychologists and the doctors at these programs, and here in Los Angeles as well, where I work. That is the official policy, and if you deny that as a therapist, as a psychiatrist, as a doctor, you can be sanctioned and have your license suspended in some states. Right now there's an act before the state legislature, which is the Medical Misinformation Act, it is, a, it is a potential law that will allow the medical board to take away the licenses of physicians who disagree with the position that I just stated. Or to say anything like what Dr. Barkey and I and Dr. Gold have been saying for the last two years about this Wuhan virus. License suspended, taken away. I'm covering a lot of topics here for a purpose. And the purpose is to remind you that what I've been saying for the last two years, that we were never in a medical pandemic, we were in a pandemic of fear, a psychological pandemic, that was using fear as a, a form of fuel, like gasoline in a car, to drive a vehicle forward. And the vehicle was not a medical vehicle. The vehicle was much bigger than that. And we see that now. The whole transgender activist cause coming for the children to physically mutilate, to chemically castrate children and 
co-opt the parents into that act of abuse and evil is yet the most recent example of what started back in March of 2020 and of course proceeded with all the fear-mongering campaigns that I just described from the 50s and the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, etc. This battle that we have right now is not about winning back our rights to not have to wear masks all the time and to refuse injections. Obviously that's important, but that is not the bigger picture. That is not the end game. That was, as Dennis Prager has said for the last couple of years, uh, the dress rehearsal to see what would, what would people be willing to do? What costume would they be willing to put on? What script would they be willing to read? What fantasy would they be willing to pretend and put up with? How far can we push it? And every time it was pushed, the pushback was nothing. I, I'm, I'm certain that these people that, that are, are not fearful, that are truly sociopathic, that are evil, and I include people like Anthony Fauci in this group, I believe he is a sociopath, I believe he is an evil human being, not misguided, not full of errors, judgment, and just narcissism. I believe he's evil. And I'll speak about evil in a moment since this is a church going crowd. I believe that those people have known all along what they were doing. And they have been dumbfounded to the degree to which Americans, 60, 70, up to 80% in some communities, like in Los Angeles, it's at least 80%, have gone along with this without really any significant pushback. I went to the post office a month or two ago, near to my office, and I walked inside and there's a table from end to end, wall to wall, with the desks and the chairs of all the workers, there are probably five or six, that always used to be open, and now there's these plexiglass shields in front, little stands, right? In between each stand is probably six feet of space. There's a little hole in the window where you can put your money and whatever, or you can reach around if you want. And all of the women that are sitting there are sitting behind these stands. And they and the customers are playing this game, this, this fantasy game, like, like children, that this little stand is some sort of a barrier of protection against a virus. And everyone's just pretending, they're just sort of nodding. Like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense to me. If I'm standing to the side of the stand, I'm putting you at risk. I'm giving you my dollar like this. But if I stand here and I put it through the hole, I'm not. And we're all going to pretend like this makes sense. That was what I came to, to, to think as I was waiting in the line. And it reminded me of little kids in the garden pretending to make pies, chocolate pies, out of dirt. They add some water, they mix it in their bucket, they make a little circle, and they put it in their oven, which is a little box that they constructed, and they, they, they drew a Sharpie marker on it, and they're, they're out there making their pies and cakes, and they're making their little pies and their cakes, and they're putting them in the oven, and all their friends are saying, this is going to be great, it looks delicious, let's give it a couple minutes to make sure that it's cooked, and the mother comes out, and she looks at that, and she says, oh yeah, it looks delicious, it looks just great, remember to make sure that the timer goes off and you cook it properly, and, and she's nodding, she's pretending, she's playing along with them, but she knows, she knows that this is just dirt. That's what we're doing as adults now in the post office. But we're pretending openly that all of this, this dirt is actually cake. As adults, we're pretending like little children. We're acting like children. As this sort of fakery, this sort of uh, pretend play became entrenched, it started to appear to me like a Twilight Zone movie, where there's one person looking around saying, I'm sorry, is that a, that's, you said that's a house, but it looks like, it looks like an ice cream cart. Oh no, it's a house. And he finally just has to say, okay, I guess it is a house. My uncle is a psychologist, retired, and he used to teach health psychology at the University of Cincinnati. And one of the courses he taught, because he taught a lot of introductory psych courses, was on the power of social persuasion. And in that lecture, since he knew there was always a student that would arrive late, every time he taught it every year, he would tell the class, okay, we're starting now. The next guy that comes in, we're going to do something. We're going to include him in a little experiment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up three ropes at some point in the middle of the class, and I'm going to start asking him to pull people out of the class and to say, tell me which rope is the longest of the three. And I want each one of you 
to tell me that the shortest rope is actually the longest. Can you all do that? Yes, yes we can, Professor, of course. Okay, thank you. There's a point to this, but I'll talk to you later. Like, okay, whatever. So of course some guy comes in a few minutes late, and he sits down around the middle of the lecture. The professor starts, my uncle starts to ask this question. He says, I just want to um, get some information from you uh, about uh, perceptual differences. He mumbles about some nonsense. Uh, uh, you, can you tell me which rope that I'm holding is the longest rope? Oh, right, this one, absolutely, a little short rope. And he does it again and again and again. He's looking over to the one guy that showed up late, and this guy is getting really uncomfortable. <laughs> he's looking around the room, he's thinking, gosh, well, it doesn't look like that to me. But they're all telling me that it's, it's this little rope, it's the longest rope. And of course, eventually, my uncle, he calls on this guy number five, number six or so in the class. He says, you, yeah, you came in a little late, um, but I want to incorporate and include you in the class. Can you tell me which, which rope is the shortest? I just want to make sure we have a consensus here. And he's really squirming now. He's, he, he knows, he knows. Do you believe me or your lying eyes? He knows that rope is too short, but he can't bring himself to say, well, it's obvious. The one that's longer is the longest rope. So he says, it's that one, the short one. And everyone in the class bursts out laughing. And he turns bright red, and immediately he realizes he's been hacked. And my professor, my, my, my uncle, the professor, says, you see, this in vivo is what we're going to be talking about today, the power of social pressure and coercion. That made a huge impression on the class. And you can imagine how rapt their attention was for the rest of the course, because they had all been part of it. It wasn't an intellectual idea. It was real. It was happening. That was 40 years ago. And that's what we're doing today, like in the post office, like in the restaurants, like this nonsense of, I have my mask on, now I have my mask off, now I have it on. But we're all doing it. Because if we don't, we're worried people are going to look at us. They're going to say, that, that guy doesn't have his mask on. He, he doesn't care about my safety. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, why is this important in the larger picture, the bigger picture? The reason why this is important is that when fear becomes entrenched, when fear starts to drive, social pressure, social pressure, as well as public policy, obviously, but just looking at it from a social population perspective, when that drives your decision making, how you interact, your very perception of what's long and short, basic stuff like that, that changes your society. And it allows you to start to believe that your son can be a girl or your daughter can be a boy. And that something as insane and obviously destructive as injecting hormones into your 12-year-old, cross-sex hormones, or removing healthy breasts is going to save your daughter from suicide. When that, started, that sort of thing starts to become common and accepted because everyone has been so fear-driven, paralyzed, and pressured, that's a very, very scary time. In my second book, which came out last week, Freedom from Fear, I described not what I just described to you, how we got here, but what do we do from here? How do we overcome this? Well, in order to do that, you have to acknowledge what's happened. There has been very little acknowledgement on a mass level of what's happened in the last two years. Very, very little. You know, when the Tutsis and the Hutus massacred one another, mostly one direction, 20, 30 years ago with machetes, slicing off limbs, slashing throats, women were raped, bodies were being burned alive, millions of people were murdered, and not, not like with a bomb. Like. So these Hutus and these Tutsis, they massacred one another, and you can imagine, these were intra-village, intra-Nicene warfare, murders, massacres. The, the neighbors had murdered the fathers of their neighbor, and their sons, and their daughters. It's not like this was an invading army that left and they could just hate the, the other side. These were people that they had grown up and lived with for generations. How do you recover from something like that? Something that evil and monstrous and personal? Well, what they did was they, they, they set up these accountability commissions. Some people who were clearly leading these charges, they were in prison. But others that, that, that were sort of pulled along with it, they were asked to come in front of these village commissions and to acknowledge exactly what they had done and to express remorse. And this went on for about 15 years. This was a big deal. 
And some people were extradited and they were put in prison forever. But the local people that had sort of participated second and third hand in this, who were still in need of being held accountable but maybe not executed, they came and they acknowledged what they had done. That accountability is largely, 40 years later, largely the explanation that's given for why that country has succeeded, why that country has, has healed. It's, it's an amazing success story. But it was based upon accountability, voluntary accountability. We don't have that yet. All we have is denial. And more lies and more lies and more lies. Truth always wins. But it's much better if it wins soon rather than late. So this fear, this pandemic of fear, this mass delusional psychosis, this paralysis of reason that has led so many Americans to make so many horrible mistakes that it wound up leading to horrific cruelty. Because most evil in the world is not performed by one or two or ten people. It's performed by the bulk, the mass of the population, who have good intentions, who are not bad people. This is very hard to fight. The, 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 the true, obvious evil, the sociopath, the murderer, the rapist, we know, we can identify who that person is. We can lock him up, put him in jail. Not in LA because we have George Gascon as our DA. But usually you can lock them up and put them away. But what do you do with the people that are good, honest, well-intentioned people, like mothers, who half of whom today are still parading their children up and down the street or pulling them like the mother that I saw outside the window of my home yesterday. She's a neighbor. Her son in a wheelbarrow pulling him, or a, a, a little wagon. wagon, thank you, a wagon, <laughs> pulling him up and down the street with a mask on her face, outdoors. That's still happening. What do you do with those people? She's committing a social injury. She is attacking. She's committing violence, to put in the words of the left. She's committing violence against our social fabric. But my body, my choice. The woman at the car wash last week, when I got back from Europe, I, my car was filthy, drove it through the car wash. She was sitting at a little booth, collecting money, probably 24 years old, wearing a mask. And I just asked her, after I overcame the shock of the 40% price increase, <laughs> from seven to $10, yeah, no inflation. It really is 40% if you actually average all the price increases. We're at 40, four zero, which is interestingly the exact amount of increased money that's in circulation now compared to before Biden was president, 40% increase. Every economist for the last 200 years knows this. Monetary supply is what drives inflation. It has nothing to do with Biden or Putin. So she says to me when I asked her, I said, well, just curious, why are you wearing a mask? And she gets very indignant and she says, because I can, and because it's none of your business, like this. And I said, you know, that is such an interesting response because that is exactly what I used to say for two years in Los Angeles when I would go into a store or a restaurant and I was told, why aren't you wearing a mask? And you know what the response was to my response? It was, get out of my store, I'll call the police. Or you're a bad person. Or you're a right-wing racist Trump supporter. Blah, 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 blah. I said, and now, and I said this to her, I said, I looked her right in the face and I said, and now you want me to respect your choice. Her face dropped. She froze for about 10 seconds. And then she slammed the little booth door shut and yelled from the inside, we're done, we're done, we're done, we're done, like a child. La, 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 la. This just happened last week. So what do you do with this? Well, I wrote the book Freedom from Fear to give some hope, some way forward, some uh, program to people who are either afraid and don't want to be afraid or who know people who are. Not to the crazy uh, BLM and Tifa rioters on the left who, I don't know what they think, although I do know that they're motivated purely by destruction. And that's what chaos really is. That's what evil is. It's, it's, it's to, to harm people and things in our lives. Uh, not for robbery to get money, not for pleasure. Uh, 
but, but just, just to destroy. Those people are hopeless. Those people really should be locked up. But the bulk of America is not like that. The bulk of America is just very, very misled and misinformed and still scared and still under pressure. And then there's the 10 or 15, 20% who have been awake all along, awake but not woke, but those people don't have enough power yet without the extra 60% to actually shift, go over, overcome the inertia that we found ourselves in of being stuck in perpetuity with this life of fear. And in certain areas, urban areas, like in Los Angeles, it is fixed. There is no going back. I do not, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, grew up in Santa Monica, born at St. John's Hospital. I do not see that city recovering. It is spiraling down at a faster and faster rate. It is not going to recover at least in a generation. It's done. I had hoped that it would recover. I would hope that there'd be some way to lift it up. It's done. There's no way. That's what I believe. So what do we do with the 60% of the people who are in the quasi-urban areas, or urban areas like Orange County, or in rural areas in America, where we can take them back to reason, take them back to reality, free them from fear. Well, one of the most effective ways to overcome something that is holding on to you, that you perform repeatedly to avoid your problems, to make yourself feel better, is an escape, which is addiction is the 12-step program. So I started to think, well, are there parallels between this, this entrenched fear and addiction? And I believe that there is. I believe that today, not, not in March, April, May of 2020, where people were terrified, scared, frozen, and then eventually became somewhat traumatized, and they still are traumatized. I mean today, are the people who are acting crazy, are they not addicted to this element of fear? Just like somebody who is addicted to whiskey takes a swig at the bottle every time something stressful comes up as a way to avoid dealing with the problem, or goes and gambles, or philanders. Addictions have a very uh, common base, and a common wiring, and a common um, repetition mechanism. Part of it is biological. Part of it is a dopamine rush. When you perform the behavior, you feel better, at least temporarily. Of course, you avoid the problem and things get worse, but you feel better in the moment. You don't have to face whatever it is that's overwhelming you. And, and you do this automatically after a while. It becomes like a, like a rut that the wagon wheel just falls into whenever you get on the road. And it becomes very hard to overcome it because addiction is inherently dishonest. Every addict is a liar, because no addict in the state of addiction can admit to himself first, and certainly not to the community or the family, that he has a problem. That's, that's a tenant of addiction. That's why in Alcoholics Anonymous, the most important thing to do is to acknowledge that you are an alcoholic, first and foremost. And if you can't do that, well, don't come to the, to the meetings. It's a waste of everyone's time. So what I believe now is that fear can be and should be seen in the same way, which is, I think, helpful on a pragmatic level because it's not stigmatizing. We no longer stigmatize addiction. In fact, we glorify it. I mean, how many times have you heard in the last year another movie star actor come out and you know, tearfully apologize for having to come clean about his or her addiction? And people just praise and laud this person. It's, it's the only thing better than coming out as an addict is coming out as a homosexual. <laughs> I mean, that's the prize, right? Maybe, maybe coming out as a transgender now can top the homosexuals. That's why they're getting really angry. Homosexuals are no longer, you know, the golden ticket. You've got to be bi-curious and two-spirit in order to top that. So it's a very important topic because today, one of the biggest forces or impetus, really, for the destruction of our society is the attacks on children. And the attacks on children are largely coming from the transgender community and ironically from women. All of the physicians and therapists at these hospitals that I mentioned, they're all women. Which is, is very bizarre. Because women, you would think they're wired to protect children. So to overcome that wiring requires a, a lot of pressure and a lot of coercion. And I'll, I'll propose why I think it's happening in a moment. 
But I think the addiction model is very important because if people can be more comfortable acknowledging that they've been scared for the last couple of years, that they've been living a life of addiction, not of being weak, although they were weak, but of being addicted to fear, and that's why they've been behaving in this way, they might be able to then come forward and ask for help. But they have to first acknowledge their fear. And in the Freedom From Fear book, The 12-Step Guide to Individual or Personal and National Recovery, the first step in that book is to acknowledge your fear. To say, I am a fear addict and I need help. And then from there, there are many, many other things that need to be done. It's not just saying that I'm afraid, but for example, if you're a drunk and you say, I'm a drunk, and then you walk home from work every day and you stop, you pass by a bar, you're going to go into that bar and you're going to drink again, guaranteed. So if you're a fear addict and all of your fear and fear mongering has come from your phone, from the Apple push feed, or from CNN or NBC or MSNBC or the LA Times or the New York Times, all of these media sources, and you keep, you keep coming back and getting fed by them, you are just going right back to the dealer. The media is the fear dealer. Now, are they not in cahoots with the government and corporations? Absolutely. But the media is the vehicle that's spitting it out at us. And the only reason now why we were able to achieve such a rapid, rapid ensconcement of fear in this country has been the media. It would never have happened this fast, never. We were primed psychologically, but the media is really what did us in. So if you're a fear addict or no one who is, the dealer has to be cut off. The media has to be removed completely removed, and then slowly brought back in, but only media that is honest. Well, Dr. McDonald, how do I know who's being honest? Everybody has a different opinion. Actually, it's very easy. Just do one thing. Look back over the last couple of years and ask yourself, those who speak, those who write, those in the media, who have been proven and shown objectively to have been telling the truth, they are likely gonna be telling you the truth today. Those who have been shown, proven, objectively shown to have lied to you, Anthony Fauci is a great example of this, so is CNN, so are all the pundits that you hear on all these legacy mainstream news organizations. They have lied repeatedly from the very beginning. It is, it is not an opinion, it is a fact. They are likely going to be lying to you today and tomorrow and next week because they don't change. This is not a you should listen to my political side argument or you should vote a certain way argument. This is just an observation about human nature and reality. And it's true on, on every side. So that's how you find good media. That's how you find honest media. Not necessarily media that you agree with, but at least they're honest. If they make a mistake, they'll own up to it. Something else that needs to be addressed, I'm not going to cover all 12, but something that I think is important now, especially in the context of all of the transgender activism and the parents and the uh, the doctors and nurses and therapists who support this uh, abuse and evil, I believe is narcissism. We become a very narcissistic culture. Everything, everything is focused on the me and not on the other. And this is even true now with parents. I think narcissism played a huge role in the parents sacrificing their children. It wasn't just fear, it was also the sense that, well, I'm more important than that child. It's all about me now. It's not about the child. Teachers, I used to admire teaching as a profession. Now I think it's despicable. The teachers were one of the biggest letdowns of the last two years. I thought if, if teachers would come forward and say, what are we doing to these children? I know children. I've dedicated my life to children. We're closing the schools for two years. This is insane. We're going to be harming them. They didn't do that, mostly. Most of them said, great. I get paid to stay home and just zoom it in every, every couple of hours for five minutes. Why did they do that? Because they thought that their paycheck, their comfort, their vacation, their union power was more important than the, the livelihood and sanctity and health of the children. Disgusting. So many groups like that. Doctors, horrible. 80% of my colleagues I don't refer to anymore, including therapists. Many of them haven't even come back to work in the office. The Analytic Institute, where I trained for eight years, I admired especially the older generation, their 60s, 70s, 80s, who I felt had worked and lived courageously to, to help individuals overcome severe emotional traumas. It's very hard to sit with somebody day after day, hour after hour for years, to help them to improve and to tolerate a lot of their abuse and manipulation and transference. I, I admired those people. 
Two years ago, the Institute shut down. It reopened three months later remotely. To this day, I still get email now. A year and a half later, still getting email about an upcoming conference with an amazing intellect coming from Israel or Europe. And I read through the email about the conference, CME credits, the fee, the time of great, great, great. And then at the bottom, Zoom invitation link will be sent upon receipt of payment. They are not meeting to discuss psychiatry, psychology, and analysis in person. These are therapists. They're still sitting at home behind their computer, a bunch of cowards. I withdrew from the Institute about nine months ago for that reason. It's done with it. This is going on over and over. Lots of sacrifices, lots of losses, lots of um, mourning for me, for friendships, collegial relationships, occupations that I used to enjoy, admire, feel a part of, a community member, aligned with, I no longer do. So part of the way forward is to acknowledge and accept that a lot of narcissistic people, a lot of people that you used to really care for, that you thought cared for you, can no longer really be invested in. This is sad because this means a lot of people will be lost to you. But it's necessary, and it's necessary for two reasons. One, because it doesn't help you or serve you to maintain relationships with people like that. And second, it creates a vacuum, it creates a space it creates a space for new relationships to form. Most of our lives are spent trying to fill the space, trying to get as busy as possible, trying to do as much as we can. That's kind of what drives Americans. It's not a bad thing. But we actually should be thinking about the opposite. We should be eliminating all of the things in our lives that are not absolutely necessary. And there's a lot of it that is we should be eliminating that to create space for what's really important. And we won't know what that is until we make the space for it. It's very hard to add something that's important to a full life. And a lot of our fullness is really just fluff. It's just popcorn. So now we have an opportunity to call that out and to create a space for real relationships with people that really matter, who are aligned with us, and that we can do good with. And that's a way to do good. And one of the ways to do that is to help encourage people to free themselves from this fear. I assume no one in this group is part of that, but sometimes I'll speak to large audiences and I'll see a few people in the audience sitting there in the back with, with a mask on. And I know they're there because they're curious and they're interested, but they're just not quite there yet. They're still living in fear. Like the patient of mine who came in with a face shield, two mask gloves, and was spraying herself with hand sanitizer, and she sat down in my office and she said, Doctor, I am so terrified, and I look like a complete fool, and I hate this, but I, I don't know what to do. I cannot let go of this. And I said, excellent, I'm so glad you're here. I can work with you, because you've acknowledged the fear and you want to move forward. But the people who come to the office with the masks on, pretending like everything is fine, nothing to see here, and I point out that they have a mask, and they say, yeah, it's my choice, it's none of your business, blah, 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 that kind of thing. I can't do anything with them. That's why I banned masks from my practice. I put a sign on the door. I said, no more masks. I don't want to hear your excuse. Yeah. yeah. I'm, time for it. I'm here to help you. And to help you, we have to start with a shared premise that we both accept reality. This is not an inpatient unit where psychotics go to Rome. You can be neurotic, but you can't see me as an active psychotic. And I don't care what you believe. I'm here to tell you what is real. And if you don't want to hear what is real for me, that's fine. You can go somewhere else. No one's forcing you to see me. But if you accept the terms and conditions of our working arrangement, you will start with reality. And then we can go from there. And part of that reality is that breathing is good and necessary. So I lost a few patients. Good riddance. But I got a lot more. And my practice is actually closed to new patients for the first time in 12 years. I don't have any more room. I cannot see new people. I'm full. So moving forward, what do we need to do? Well, I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic, but I'm still trying to maintain some objective optimism. I'm pessimistic because I see that we're really at a crossroads, and I think the next few months, especially this election coming up, is going to be very determinative of the next 10 or 20 years. And unfortunately, what I've seen recently in LA with the failed recall election for George Gascon, and prior to that, Gavin Newsom, 
doesn't give me a lot of hope that we're going to have free and fair elections in November anywhere in the country. Mail-in ballots are now ubiquitous, and you cannot have a free and fair election with mail-in ballots, nor without voter ID. It's not possible. Now, to what degree will it be unfair, and to what degree will it actually put in candidates that didn't really get elected? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. But that's really going to be an arbiter, a litmus test of whether we have a shot. Because if we no longer have a free and fair election, or at least the possibility of having real candidates who really win actually win, then we're going to turn away a whole section of America that has been patient and nonviolent up to now. And we'll see, and I think understandably, that there is no more movement or possibility of movement forward in the political process, that they have been disenfranchised. And the only thing left will be violence. I think that is a very distinct possibility. And it's, it's completely rational. And I don't support violence in that way, but I understand it. It's not insane. It's actually very reasonable. And because there is a very good likelihood that a lot of people who are in left-wing positions of power will lose those positions in November because they keep doubling and tripling down on their idiocy and harming more and more people, even their own supporters, because of that, this is an all-or-nothing gamble for them. They're going to go scorched earth and, and cling to the, to the reins of power, or they're going to go down. And so a lot of bad stuff is going to happen before the election. Really bad stuff. We're already seeing examples of it now with excesses and abuses of power. You can all see examples of it in the news in the last few weeks. Stuff you would have never expected, ever in this country, until the last year. So this is a big problem on a political level. On an economic level, we're at the brink of collapse. We have a monetary supply that's, that's rapidly disintegrating. A safety, social safety, physical safety level, all of our cities are, are unsafe. Rapes, murders, arson, robbery, home invasions, mob violence at stores. It's, it's all gone up three, five, seven hundred percent in all the urban areas that are controlled by Democrats anyway in this country. Street Socially, street we have street takeovers here in Los Angeles constantly. The bridge that was just reopened in downtown LA to Great Fanfare was shut down for weeks because of vandalism, street takeovers, and violence. Brand new multi-billion dollar bridge done. Socially, familially, things are going downhill. I described the transgender debate problem. Uh, that's, that's a huge example. And the biggest example of the encroachment of evil, I believe, is the attack on children. So I think on some level, fundamentally, a lot of what's going on now can be explained by power corruption and just narcissism. But there's an element to some of this. I'm going to finish with this because I think it's important, although a lot of people may not accept or agree with it uh, in general. There's an element of what I've been describing during this, this talk today that I can't explain as a psychiatrist. I can't explain it as an aberration of psychology, as, as developmental arrest, selfishness, um, anger, uh, ignorance. There is something that has, that has erupted, and I don't know if it's an opportunistic eruption or whether it's a de novo, just like, say, a healthy tree doesn't get water for a few years and you start to see parasites and infections attacking it. The parasites were always there, but it just came in because it was immunocompromised. Same thing happens if you have an immunocompromised body. You start to see candida and rashes and infections and fungus. It's always there. Our body is containing this all the time, but we, we fight it because we have strength. Perhaps we don't have that strength anymore. We're like the diseased tree. We haven't been watered for a long time. So what's happening now, whether it's new or whether it's opportunistic, is the rise of evil. And I do believe that there's some diabolical presence afoot that has begun to take over the hearts and minds of some of the most integral elements of our community, our doctors, our nurses, our mothers, teachers. I cannot explain some of this behavior any other way. I cannot explain how a, a, a woman doctor and a mother can advocate for the sterilization of a 12-year-old girl because she likes to wear uh, farmer clothes and call herself Tom. I can't explain that. Especially not when they talk about it with a smile on their face on an advertisement that you can watch on YouTube. Or uh, a teacher who advocates for the same thing. I, I, I can't explain it. 
there is something beyond my capacity to explain rationally that I believe is a diabolical evil presence. And how do we fight that? See, that's that's a really important question, oh, particularly when the country is becoming more and more secular, and when churches are under attack. AA programs were shut down. So were churches. Any place where people congregate and do good, closed. Not bars, not gambling casinos, not strip clubs. All of that was kept open. That's that's not an error. So moving forward. From fear, we, I, I'm not going to speak about the solution to evil, that's not my domain. But moving forward from fear is, and I do believe that we can move forward from it, but we have to think about it from a psychological point of view, and we have to think about what has worked in the past. And that is 12 step, that is addiction programs, that is community support, that is gathering like minded people together. If we can address the fear, which I still believe today is on a psychological level, putting aside the question of evil, the core driving force, there's others, I understand that, but the core driving force of the loss of our freedom, our liberty, our ability to act with courage, this fear is so powerful and it's so entrenched. If we can fight back against that and overcome that on an individual level, because I think now, Top down is over. We've got to start at an individual level, which is why the book is addressed to the individual. My first book was addressed to the nation. If we can start on an individual level and build up, just like we're doing in school districts and school boards throughout the country, Virginia, San Francisco, Orange County, Florida, just last week, majority conservative school board, first in the state, all the school boards, this can happen. This actually is possible if we stand up, express courage, and overcome fear at an individual level, local level. That will inspire and encourage others at the county, in the state, and the national level to step back up, let go of the fear, take a risk, and do the right thing. And if we get just enough to overcome this inertia that we're in now, in the wrong direction, then we can contain, corral, excise surgically and perhaps physically in prison if necessary that small contingent of people who are hopeless who are sociopathic and the people who are actually doing evil and know that they're doing evil the evil people that's what we've always used to do in the united states and we stopped doing it and we need to change that and then i think we have a way forward then i think we have hope i am honestly completely agnostic at this point about whether this will work I do not know. I used to be very optimistic. Now I am, it's a coin toss. We might lose our country, we might save it before 2023, and I do not know. I do know that when I was in Europe, for the six weeks that I was there, what I saw was the opposite of what I see here. I saw disobedience, I saw non-compliance, and I saw what they call in Bosnia, Sloboda, which is the Bosnian word for freedom. It's also the name of their local soccer team and the oldest cafe in Tuzla. They, ironically, the Bosnians, embody, express, and worship freedom Sloboda more than Americans do. And they were inspired by the United States to do it. Isn't that ironic? So if there's a shining light of freedom, of, of, of fearlessness, of courage, it may actually come from those countries and not from the United States. But we have to keep the torch alive here because if, if ours goes out, I don't know if those other little candles will stay lit. They want to, but they need that light from the United States. And, and we're flickering, just like this microphone <laughs> about to go out. So thank you. I'm going to take a few questions, um, and then I'll be at the back to sign my first book, the United States of Fear, and encourage everyone to please order the current one, Freedom from Fear, which I don't have physical copies of because it takes a few weeks to get, but you can purchase on Amazon. So I'll take some questions, just a couple of caveats. Please don't ask me clinical questions. My grandmother's really sick and, and give a medical history and spend eight minutes. If I'm, your grandmother is lovely and very important person, but, but not to everyone in the room in that way. Please ask a question that will actually be useful to others. And the second point, please keep your sentence reasonably short so I can take more questions. If I spend four, <coughs> spend four minutes listening to your question, then it just takes time away from other people. So please just keep that in mind and be happy to answer as long as I can. Yes, you. I'm Mr. Sure, man, I'm fear of being admitted to a hospital and becoming a prisoner. 
subject to their $39,000 bonus they get for diagnosing you and, uh, and putting a trick to, to two of it. I caught not the first three words, but the rest of it. Repeat the first, what's the question part of it? How to overcome, first of all, is it a reasonable fear or is it an irrational fear? How to overcome the fear that one might have of being shipped into a hospital and being forced to be on a ventilator or a feeding tube? Is it a reasonable fear? What does one do? I think it's, <laughs> I think that fear was absolutely rational and reasonable uh, until recently. I don't think that that's, I don't think that's any longer a, a, a main issue right now in the hospitals in the country. There are problems in the hospitals with not being treated. In other words, being denied care if you don't show these so-called vaccine cards or don't want to wear a mask. That's still going on in a lot of hospitals, especially in LA. I know uh, one surgeon, a woman, again, these darn women, uh, she has turned away scheduled breast cancer patients, and I mean women with breasts, not transgender, real women with breasts for breast cancer because they showed up and they didn't have a booster card. She's willing to allow women to die of cancer. A woman surgeon, breast cancer reconstructive surgeon, because the women patients don't show up with the, the paper pass. So there's still issues, there's still problems in medicine like that, but that you will be um, pushed into a ventilator, denied care, uh, not denied care, but put on a feeding tube, uh, not being given the ability to, uh, to, to engage in your care. I don't see that currently as being a significant problem. The, the more serious problem right now, in my view, what I've been seeing and hearing, has been uh, doctors and, and, and nurses and staff actually refusing to help patients who need it because they're not willing to go along with the program. That's still an issue. Uh, the woman two rows behind you. Yeah, you. Uh huh. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for saying what a lot of us feel um, and the courage to do so. Um, what are your thoughts on the bigger picture? We, a lot of us have heard the Great Reset, the billionaires, uh, Bill Gates buying all the farmland. What are your thoughts on how much of a threat that is, and, and what we can do about it? It's a huge threat. I didn't address it because it's a big topic and it's an international one and I tend to focus on domestic issues, uh, partly because I know that better than the international, although I do follow what's going on in the world. Um, I'm not an expert on all topics and all details. It's impossible to be an expert on everything, obviously. But I do believe that it is a significant problem. I do believe that this is a transnational issue. It is, it is not an American problem. It is an international problem. And I know this from speaking with many people in Europe who are in the know, both face-to-face -face and also remotely. There does appear to be a movement, and I don't mean you know people in robes underground in a star chamber, I mean a real out there, out front, you know, Klaus Schwab, not hiding anything movement, Bill Gates, etc., to destroy and eliminate all borders, particularly in advanced developed countries to eliminate uh, the sanctity of mono monolingualism in a country, to, to keep a language sacrosanct, basically a Tower of Babel, and to dilute out culture that is specific to a region or a nation to the point where there is no more unique culture left. That is happening here in the US under the current administration. Borders, language, culture are all being destroyed. We have literally an invasion into our country. I don't know what we're up to. Three, four million illegal aliens have invaded our borders in the last 18 months, depending on who you ask. That is, that is an invasion. That is not a tribe of people breaking the law. That is an invasion. That is larger than many uh, populations of small countries. We have that now in our, in our country. We don't have a uh, monolingual culture anymore. We have 17 languages on every ballot. Many people don't even speak English and don't care to anymore. We don't have Judeo-Christian values, which is what our society was founded on. We, we idolize Islam and we put uh, preachers in jail. I mean, this is, this is upside down, really. And it's happening in other countries as well. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in Poland, it's happening in Australia, it's happening in um, Great Britain, France, Spain. This is an international problem. What can we do about it? Well, I personally don't believe there's much point in trying to fight things on a national level, certainly not an international level. I still hold out the hope that the U.S. 
as a nation, through a ground-up approach, can regain its strength, we can retake our country, and if the United States is strong, then I think this can stop. I don't believe this can happen and succeed with a strong United States. I don't believe that it can. With a weak United States, absolutely. And that is probably why the Ukraine was invaded, because the United States was weak. And that is definitely why China is taking over, because the United States is weak. So how do we stop it? Well, in an indirect way, we stop it by regaining the strength of the U.S. That's how we stop it. Uh, yes, in the uh, t-shirt, pina, Col pina colada shirt. Oh, these yeah. colors, sorry. <laughs> Dr. McDonald, uh, all I have is a five minute speech. <laughs> People that know me know that's true. Um, thank you for your finely tuned common sense. And I don't really have a question, but I have a thought I'd like you to comment on. So at, in my group, We the People, I just spoke on the concept of hope right now and fighting the good fight. Um, so even though you said you're not qualified to talk on this subject, the answer to everything you've said today is the love of God. The fact that God created us to be free people, to stand up and be Christian soldiers and to not turn the other cheek. Please talk about what you feel you're not qualified to talk about, which is the love of God. So which two points to that, and, well, two points. The first point is, yes, I agree, and yes, the presence of religiously committed individuals and communities is absolutely central and necessary for us to win this battle. I do believe that. The second point, which follows the first one, is that's exactly why they're under attack. This is why churches are so threatened. <laughs> it's just a deal. The only organized, effective force in this country that is left against those who wish to destroy it, which I'll just for sake of simplicity call the left, although it comprises others that are not necessarily leftists, but that's the good word to use. The only reason or the only organized group that's left that fights this are conservative Christians. That's it. There's no one else. And that's the reason why they're being targeted more than any other group. That's what I believe. And I'm not saying this as a way to support religion or to proselytize. I'm just offering this as an objective, I think objective uh, comment and observation to explain a, why it's so important, and B, why they're under attack. They're under attack because they're important. And why are they important? Because they solidify and exemplify all of the strengths, powers, and values that are opposed to the takeover. Independence, obeying a higher authority, which is not a state, families, community, law obeying, a moral code, which is not relative, but objective and absolute. All of that and more. That's why. Yeah. Up front here, the hat and the sunglasses. So, as a school teacher, when my 12, 13 year old students say, Why do you not wear a mask like the other teachers? What's an appropriate yet honest, age appropriate way to respond to that? What? Well, you say age appropriate, it's an important point because as a teacher, you, you know, and as a, any parent would know this as well, that you have to. Identify your audience before you answer a question. And, and when I say your audience, I mean in this specific context, the age of your, your audience. And you have to use different language and different words and different points to little kids versus adolescents versus adults. Very, very important. Now, somebody who's you know 12 year old has got a pretty good vocabulary, pretty good sense of the world, not five or six. Um, I think that it's fair, reasonable, and honest Although, of course, it's an individual decision on you know, whether you want to take this risk, because every it's, speaking truth is a risk, right? So to what degree do you want to take a risk is to what degree you're going to be truthful. That's really just the bottom line. Um, at this point, I think it's free, reasonable, fair, and, and truthful to say, I don't wear a mask because masks don't help protect people from getting sick, and this is very important, and because they hurt people, and they hurt us. 
Why, why teacher, do they hurt us? They hurt us because we are meant to show our faces. And when we hide our faces, we make ourselves small. And if you want to add this, you could. There are other countries and other places in the world who force people to hide their faces. And we, in this country, we don't believe in that. Because we believe that people should be free to show their faces everywhere they go. That's what I would say. Any other questions? And way back, blue, blue shirt. Can someone uh, reverb her question back up? Because she's seated, so it's a little hard for me to hear. There's a lot of, um, I have a lot of thoughts about tattoos. I'll, I'll give you a couple here. Uh, and again, this is from a psychological, psychiatric perspective. Um, my, my belief, understanding, and view about tattoos is that they are in a, a, a very um, concrete uh, symbol and public, usually public, we're talking about public tattoos usually, expression of tribalism. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that necessarily to applaud or decry. It's just an observation. Although I do have views about whether they're good or bad. Tribalism has been the human condition for thousands of years. We are inherently tribal. And it was really only in the last few hundred years when we overcame tribalism that we developed a higher good socially, which was a nation state. And it's not a natural thing. The nation is not a natural evolution of the tribe. The tribe is there to protect by killing off the other. The nation is not. The nation is there to integrate, assimilate, and form a boundary, which is not necessarily a violent one, and allow people who are like-minded, who share similar views, language, culture, etc., to stay and grow and develop, and to politely and non-violently eject those who don't. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge evolution. That is going away now, for all the reasons that I just described. It's going away because it gets in the way of a monopoly on power by an international group. If you can retribalize people, and if you maintain control over the police force, whatever that is, now suddenly you're on top. It's hard to do that with individual nations because there's a counterbalancing effect of power all the time. And that's one of the main reasons why I believe the nation state is under attack. That's why the EU was formed. And that's fortunately why Great Britain left. So why does this matter? What does this have to do with tattoos? Because they're interrelated, because tattoos are an expression of tribalism. Now yes, they're also an expression of kids just want to have fun, uh, acting out, rebellion. Yes, 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 I, I, I know that. But the rise, this exponential rise and increase in tattoos recently, recently, I believe is, is, is for other reasons. And I believe for a lot of people, again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very general because there's exceptions, but, but in general, the movement, I believe, is coming from a large segment of our community, of our society, that no longer feels that they have a sense of identity or purpose or meaning. They feel lost. And one of the most concrete, tangible ways to regain a sense of identity and community, to, to find your tribe, is to put ink on your body that's permanent particularly when you can use it publicly to identify yourself. It's a public identification. I'm in with this group. That is what I believe from a psychological point of view, and I see it with my patient population, where tattoos have become very normalized in very young people. Not, I'm not talking about people in their 30s and 40s. I mean like, like kids, like barely 18. Some of them are younger and they're getting tattoos. And I believe a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that concurrently a lot of these young people have really lost their way in terms of who they are, their identity, whether it's a gender identity, whether it's an identity of values, of, of religion, of uh, goals and place in the world, what they intend to do with their lives. That's really been under attack and destroyed in the last few years. Men and women, young men, young women, they don't have a clue who they are. Not a clue, they're totally lost. So tattoos are a way for them to find an anchor and a way for them to be visually appreciated by others and to, to find a pretend way to, to connect with an identity. 
Yes. Uh, you're in the front. How would you address gay and lesbian choices with natural bodies and not pushing an agenda for transgender society? Well, I think a distinction needs to be made between gay, lesbian, and transgender. They're absolutely completely unrelated to one another. Um, sexual orientation, being gay, has nothing at all to do with your gender identity or how you see yourself. There also is really not, uh, among the larger community of gays in the US, a, a lot of real activism to convert people to being gay or, or really there's no discrimination against gays much at all really anymore in this country. So there's really no, this, this battle was, was sort of won. Um, the, the active proselytizing and activism, it's, it's, a, it's of a religiosity that you don't even see in Christianity today. The, the greatest locus of religiosity is not with uh, Christians or Jews um, in this country, it, it's with seculars. I mean, their religiosity and their, their dedication to it on an irrational level is miles away from any extremism in the Christian community that I can find. So, the problem that we have now, in my view, is that transgenderism as an activist movement has been piggybacking on the now, and I think to some degree, you know, socially at least, legally acceptable existence of homosexuality. When I say that, what I mean is putting aside the religious aspects in terms of allowing people to live freely in society, that I don't believe there should be any discrimination or laws against somebody for their, their sexual orientation um, as a citizen. But it, it doesn't cause any problems in that way, other than the marriage issue, which I, I don't support that. But, but in terms of being able to, to work or to, to move freely and to have a passport, et cetera, to work. But with transgender, we're looking at a different thing. We're looking at um, not only a movement, an activist movement, but also a redefining. This is the thing, it's a redefinition, which is why I don't like the, 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 the Gay Marriage Act, because it's a redefinition of marriage. I think that's a problem. Um, we're redefining what it means to be a man and a woman. And again, putting aside the religious aspect, it is biologically wrong. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational, and it's destructive, and it's harmful. It goes against basic common sense, basic reality. It's like green is black, black is green. Whenever you have, whenever there's an attack on reality, we're not talking about social evolution, uh, politics and, and opinions, uh, uh, achieving a cultured society, those are all distractions. When you attack reality, now you're doing evil. You're, you're, you're using language and you're perverting language in a way that is causing harm. And so I think it's one thing that's very important for people who are trying to fight this evil is to make a clear distinction between their positions attacking, and they should be attacking, and shutting down the perversion of reality and language in the transgender movement, which leads, of course, to abuse of children, which is the greatest horror, and their positions and views on homosexuality. I think they're very, very different, and they need to be treated as such. And most people are, to their credit. And I'm glad that finally people are standing up and saying, look, I have no problem with my neighbor being gay, and I am, I am not in any way attacking gays, but this attack on the sex of our children, this is evil and I'm gonna fight it, and not having to apologize for that. I think that's really important. Uh, in the back with the hand raised. This was just brought up in the news yesterday. The question or comment has to do with the normalization of pedophilia by renaming it again, raping language, and calling it, renaming it. Uh, tell me again what the acronym is. Minor attractive persons map. Yeah, it, it is. It is sick. Uh, it's. It's. I can't even think of an example. It's so horrible. When you, when you use a euphemism and you rebrand and rename something which is at its core evil as something that is palatable, you're doing obvious violence to language, you are attacking reality, you are lying, and then you are using all of that as a vehicle to wrong others and to disarm and disenfranchise and inhibit, decriminalize, 
Well, you are ultimately decriminalizing pedophilia. That's the end goal. But before you get to the decriminalization, you're going to shift the stigma of abuse of children onto those who attack those who abuse children. Mm -hmm. In other words, as Dennis Prager often says, and I think this is a universal truth, those who push this sort of agenda, which is largely the left, and I say the left to mean sort of those who were the progeny of the Leninist revolution, the Marxists, who were the, the, the originators of the rape of language and attack on reality and using uh, social pressures and cues and power dynamics to, to, to really seize control and hurt the, the little people. Those who do this, they don't fight evil. They only fight those who fight evil. And they're very successful because those who fight evil often don't want to be attacked. They don't want to be criticized. They don't want to be ostracized. So they, they, they stay silent. But the left is very good at attacking those people because they see them, reasonably speaking, as threats to their agenda. Because their agenda is not to fight evil. Their agenda is to destroy, to sow chaos. And anyone who gets in the way of that agenda is attacked. So you can almost use this as a litmus test. You can see, who is this person fighting? Is this person fighting evil? No. But, then who and what exactly is he fighting? And I guarantee you, in almost every case, he or she is going to be fighting somebody who's fighting evil. And that's a really good test to see who's a leftist and who's not. Any other questions? Okay, one last question from you in flat shirt. Is there any other explanation other than the artificially, uh, let's say, needed induced fear of the pandemic or fear of death to explain why those who, shall we say, on the left are so uh, uh, in favor of my body, my choice, so in favor of abortion, but yet so also in favor of mandatory vaccination? Yes, and it's an excellent point and an excellent distinction. The comment has to do with what is the other, if there is one, motivation besides fear for those on the left, for you know, just an inclusive word here, for those on the left to adopt what seem to be such inconsistent positions, my body, my choice, when it comes to abortion, but not with masks or shots. It seems incongruent, right? I mean, if they're all just afraid, wouldn't they be all afraid for themselves and others and just want everybody to be safe? Now, obviously, that's not a good reason to make decisions, but it's a rational one. You know, when you're afraid, you start to do things that, that are kind of destructive out of, out of fear. The answer to that question, I, my answer is, I don't believe that's what's driving them. I think that's what's driving people who are reacting to fear, but many of the people who say that they want to protect safety and expand freedom and keep young children from committing suicide and giving women choice and all that stuff, I think that's actually a ruse. I don't think that the people, largely speaking, who are actually pushing for abortion, for example, I don't believe they, they care less. I don't think they care less about a woman's choice. I don't think it had anything to do with that. And the proof isn't just what you said. If they really believed in women's choices, they would honor women's choices in all areas, wouldn't they? To not get an injection, to not wear a mask, to be able to stay home and not go to work if they're married, right? But they don't honor that. They don't believe in choice. That's a lie. That is a ruse. That is the, that is the, the false pedestal that they've been standing on and have been able to achieve so much power over the years because most Americans believe in choices because choice indicates presence of freedom. I'm putting aside the whole moral question of abortion, that is, that's, that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about it from a psychological point of view and one of honesty and truth. None of these activists believe in women's freedom and women's choice. Are you kidding me? None of the people that uh, are, are talking about safety, they don't believe in safety. All of it, all of it has to do with control and power. And they pick and choose their positions and their justifications and rationalizations for their positions based on what they think will garner them the most support, rile up the crowd, 
and stifle dissent from the other side. Because who wants to be against choice? I believe in choice. Everyone is pro-choice, but not really. Not really. So the debate is not really about choice and about safety. The real debate, the underpinnings of it, have to do with very simply this. Do we believe that this country should encourage dependence on government and groups and powers way above us that are not deific and not deified? Do we believe in dependency? Primarily on a national, focused, locust dependency place like Washington? Do we believe in that? Or do we believe in independence? Individual choices, real choices, real freedom. That's really where this hinges. And if we can formulate the debate and the, and the fight and the battle in that sense, rather than arguing about points of life and death and morality, I think those are important, you know, about the abortion debate, but, but it's, it's, too, it's too focused. If we can get the bigger, we have to, we have to think about the war, not the battle. We get so, we on, on the conservative side and traditional side get so caught up in these battles and we forget that there's a larger war being fought. And a lot of these skirmishes are distractions. We get pound and pound and pound on this battle while the, 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 the major war over here is just being taken, being lost. And I think that's something that we have to do. One specific example that would be education. We're constantly fighting and battling, trying to get some semblance of truth and honesty and reality in the local school. Please, just don't allow my child to turn into the opposite sex. We're, we're dying on that hill. Why don't we just take the kids out of school? Why are, we, why are we battling to the end of time for this one public school? Now, if your school has a little bit of a problem and you can get it cleaned out, absolutely, well, why not? But by and large, the public school system in this country is over, it's done. It needs to be abandoned. We need to take our kids out of school and, and homeschool them and, and build community schools and then rehire the good teachers to teach in the community schools and let all the other ones rot where they deserve to be. Yes, that's the war. That's the war. And that's an example of what I mean by that, the war versus the battle. And we, we largely, we just don't get it yet. That's my opinion. I find a lot of people that I have. Last comment and then I'll be heading to the They're not leaders. They don't have a mind of their own. It's easier to say, okay, I believe in abortion because all my ten girlfriends do. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but I have always had people who are followers, not leaders, and they can't say no. It's Lord of the Flies. It is. People are followers. They're not leaders. How do you change that? Very simply. Information. But they don't well, information them. is helpful, but I think more importantly, it's expressing courage. You expressing courage because courage... Just like followers and following, courage is also contagious. And people may never be out in the front, the tip of the spear, the followers, but they will follow the courageous versus the feckless, the losers, the weak, the shenanigan acting people and the sociopaths. If they have a good reason, they feel protected by that, they will. So they're not hopeless. But yes, following is a problem, and we have to use it to our advantage. All right, thank you. Thank you.